Hello, <laughs> just in case it uh, may have occurred to you that I often speak about uh, the same thing, uh, here is another uh, version of that, and um, uh, because it, it's really needed. And so uh, I'm going to read to you something that, uh, that I've written, uh, which I find very important, and um, I find it very important. I know you don't, but I do. And um, so that's why I repeat it. And so anyone who has read or uh, heard uh, what I say or what I write, um, they may wonder, why do I so often repeat myself? Yeah. And um, if what I say is true, if language, as I say, doesn't exist inside of us, why do I keep saying that? Why, why don't I just get on with it? Why do I keep repeating the importance of recognizing that there is no, there are no words inside of me? Well, that's what this writing is all about. And perhaps I have already said it, but it doesn't matter. I am addressing the conditioning history of disembodied language, which has burdened all of mankind with the falsehood that we can think and that we have thoughts. You see, that falsehood is based on the notion that there are words, sentences, that there is language inside of us and there is no such thing. I continue to write and speak against the mind, yeah, because that's also your belief in your mind, your identity. Because it is only when we speak or when we write, that is, it is only when we use our language as it is supposed to be used, namely overtly, yeah. It's only when we use our language overtly that we can get clear about things. So it is only when we step away from this whole false notion that there's inner language and that we actually begin to say something so that we can hear it and that we begin to write about saying and hearing something so that we can read it. And it is only when we talk about stuff and listen to ourselves that we can ascertain our language is embodied. And only then, only then, after we have spoken with ourselves, after we have listened to ourselves, do we realize how to use our language properly. My argument is that we don't use our language properly in disembodied language, which has, yeah, which has undermined us with this whole notion of inner language. Wait, I need to put on my glasses, otherwise I cannot read it. Can we write about our, oh yeah, oh yeah, so it's only when we have spoken with ourselves and when we listen to ourselves that we can also write about our embodied language in which there is no longer any inner conversation going on in our head, yeah? So when you listen to yourself, when you speak out loud with yourself, you will notice there is no thought you are blank and that is beautiful because that is your natural way of being. You are just empty. So this whole made up story about our ability to think has prevented us from truly talking with ourselves and of course with each other. Yeah, because if we are not talking with ourselves, we're also not really talking with each other. We have only been trying to dominate each other, fight with each other, uh, 
escape from each other, run away from each other, ignore each other. Th that's all we have been doing in the name of disembodied language. We have not really connected with ourselves and with each other. That's impossible with disembodied language. So it is that disembodied language which has given rise to this, this, this fake notion of thought. So we have made up this story about our ability to think, which has prevented us from truly talking with ourselves and truly hearing ourselves. Yeah? Which of course precedes our ability to be able to talk and listen to others. Stated differently, speaking with our own resonant sound, and what is resonant sound? Resonant sound is the sound that we have when we hear ourselves. The sound which resonates with our body, the instrument of sound. It is our natural sound. So only when we speak with a resonant sound, we are using our language correctly, which is naturally. And it is the only thing, this way of talking, in which we use our language naturally, it is the only thing which is able to counteract our conditioning. That there is a me inside of me who is the originator, the doer, the cause of my language or of my action. This so-called psyche or ego or personality or being, whatever name we have given to it, with our disembodied language, yeah, we have given all sorts of names to it, a soul, it doesn't exist. And our language enlightenment is the only reason why we would want to have embodied language and go against what everyone else is doing. So why am I repeating what I'm saying? It is because of my language enlightenment and because I go against what everyone else is saying with my embodied language. Correct. Our language enlightenment is the disappearance of who we have believed ourselves to be. To get clear on our true nature requires that we continue with our embodied language as every time that we return to our disembodied language we are basically going back to square one. So the entire tragic force of all human history is on our shoulder. Each instance we revert back again to disembodied language even though we have already established the difference between disembodied language and embodied language. So I am also here running ahead of things where I assume that the difference between disembodied language and embodied language has already been understood, which, ha which it hasn't. But I have, and so in spite of that being the case, that doesn't mean that I am impervious to disembodied language. I mean, of course, I know that I can go back again to embodied language, but there are millions of reasons why our disembodied language will again be triggered. And the only thing we can do is to take note of it, to laugh about it, and to continue with our embodied language. And that's exactly what I'm doing. So each time we deal with our language in a conscious manner, it's very clear to us that we are doing something right. And so our embodied language in spoken and in written form teaches us right from wrong. And although we tend to hang on to the old notion that we think that there is an inner entity who uses language, this is all an illusion. Unless we let ourselves know again and again and as often as is needed 
the fantasy will just continue. Again, it is our overt language. Yeah, overt, that word means that you can hear it, you can say it, you can write it and you can read it. It's observable, yeah, it's observable behavior. It's not just something imagined that goes on inside of you, which we can never really trace. So again, it is our overt language, which can be said, heard, written or read, which brings reality into our words. But as long as we remain obsessed with imaginary things, we are neither saying something, hearing something, writing something or reading something. And we get lost due to how we believe our language to work. So we have assumptions about the workings of our language which are absolutely wrong. The workings of our embodied language is not a belief, but the workings of our disembodied language is a belief. And I should say, it is just like any other belief, like religious belief. In our common religious belief, people believe in, let's say, the fact that, or the fact, <laughs> the, the, the assumed fact, the Christian assumed fact. <laughs> yeah, it's a fact that in Christianity, people believe that everything is in the hands of God, just like in the, in the, in the uh, Islam or in the Muslim world, they believe everything is in happening because of Allah. However, um, this so-called ref this reference to a higher power, there's also, at the same time people do not realize this, but there's also an inner deity, yeah, which is who we are ourselves privately and who we believe to be ourselves, our identity, which of course is our entire history of conditioning. Yeah. Even when people give up on their religion, yeah, the atheist, then their belief in their so-called so true self, it even gets stronger. So they get even more hung up on who they supposedly are. So you see this very strongly here in the United States, where individual freedom has taken such a big, uh, yeah, you could say, uh, step forward in, in terms of human history. Individuals have got individual rights, and so everybody's basically going nuts in the name of individualism. And, and, and society is basically falling apart because of that. <laughs> yeah. And we're not supposed to talk about it, no, because it is everybody's right to act stupid. <laughs> and of course, we act stupid in the name of more than one thing only. We act stupid in the name of, uh, of politics, of religion, uh, of also culture. But we also act stupid in the name of what has been written. Because supposedly what has been written is more important than what was than what is said. And so this is this is this is how we got into this whole quagmire with our technology where everybody is on their phone <laughs> and they're just texting and their and their social skills are completely declining. And yet when you and I meet or when we have the same work situation or whatever, we still need to talk. And when we have a family or when we have kids or relationships with somebody, then we still need to talk. There's no way around that. And so that's where everything keeps going wrong. And then you get all the complications of the fact that we cannot talk or that we do not talk effectively. And then you get all these yeah, problems with relationship and all the fallout from that, that we, uh, yeah, that we basically uh, cannot work things out. Anyways, as I was saying, in religion there is, of course, a higher power that people pray to. Their God, their Allah, or whatever. And uh, for the atheist, there is the, the, the inner self, yeah? Or there is the supposed transcendence of the inner self, which then becomes... Because there's also, of course, with a lot of atheists, they, they kind of refer to Buddhism. Yeah, they refer to, I don't know, Eastern philosophy and... Uh, then, then they hang on to this whole notion of, I don't know, going beyond the mind, yeah? And it's all uh, 
captured with words like consciousness and meditation. But the bottom line is, their disembodied language continues. And their belief in an inner self, it also continues. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> so, in our common religious beliefs, People say that everything is in the hands of God, that everything is caused by some higher power. But privately, with disembodied language, we all believe in our inner deity, in ourselves, our identity, which of course is our history, or rather, our history of conditioning. Yeah? Even when people give up on religion, this belief in our so-called true selves becomes stronger. Everything in modern Western society is still based on the outdated assumption of this independent, free, autonomous individual soul who supposedly creates everything with his or her own experience, perception, description, explanation and prediction. Yeah, that is, that's, 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 an, that's a, also a, the belief in science, right? What I'm expressing here. Yeah, we, we perceive something, we, we see something and then we describe it and then we try to explain it. And then, then we hypothesize and we predict. That's that's science. So, <clears throat> also science is at the core of uh, why we still have disembodied language. And science, it, not accidentally, is based on written language, not on spoken language. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, we're supposed to for completely forget or abandon spoken language if we want to be scientific. All right, almost done. <laughs> so. Although I have said and written many times, also I have, have said and written this many times as an individual, oh, that only as an individual we can have embodied language. Oh, yeah. Only I have said and written many times that only as an individual I can have embodied language because disembodied language is the language of the group, yeah, because you can only in a free society, begin to attend to yourself and recognize the difference between disembodied language and embodied language. Um, it is not me who causes my embodied language. So even though I can acknowledge the difference between embodied language and disembodied language, it isn't me who is causing disembodied language. But it is, yeah, what I call my language enlightenment, which makes me want to have embodied language. In other words, there is a natural inclination in each of us, because I do not only believe this about myself, but I believe this about everybody. In other words, there is a natural inclination in each of us to want to dissolve. And that is really what our language enlightenment is. That's why you want to go to sleep at night, you just want to dissolve. And that's why you want to do all kinds of things that you feel good about, whether it is playing soccer or any other kind of game. <laughs> you, you just want to do something in which you can dissolve, in which you can let yourself go, in which you can not be in your so-called mind. Yeah, it has nothing to do with your mind. There is no mind. But you just want to be total in something. And so that's why you feel good about something, because you haven't held back. You have spent your whole energy on something. Anyway, people do all kinds of things to dissolve. They go for walks, they do yoga or whatever, they do prayer or whatever. They do all sorts of things or they, they work very hard. or You know, people do everything to forget themselves, basically, to dissolve. Because that it is also a certain forgetfulness, a certain avoidance of who they are. They are running away from themselves and they are trying to escape themselves forever and ever. So people seek all kinds of ways to dissolve or to lose themselves in all sorts of ways. But interestingly, they do not do this by speaking with themselves or by listening to themselves. Because that would truly make them go beyond their own identity. Yeah. If you would actually begin to spend some time talking out loud with yourself and you would really truly listen to yourself, you would go beyond all your nonsense that you have been claiming as true. And you would have to admit to yourself, wow, 
I have believed in all this nonsense, yeah. And you will not have to just admit it once. No, you will have to repeatedly re admit that. Because you need to and repeatedly admit that before it begins to subside. Yeah. By writing about this process, everything is put into perspective. And the way in which we got entangled with our language can only be disentangled with our correct way of using our language. In our ongoing embodied language, we experience our language enlightenment. And yes, there is no mind. There never was. There never was any inner language. <laughs>